Welcome back. It's Dr. Rob, and we're talking about the end times and prophecy, the prophecy puzzle trying to fit the pieces together. And our next topic, next to the Antichrist, has generated probably the greatest speculation as to her identity, and that is the harlot who rides the beast in Revelation chapter 17. Who did John think she represented? Who does she represent today? And who does she represent in this future time? And this woman is described in great detail. So the portrait of the harlot is in 17, one and two. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adult adulteries. Now, we are in symbolic language here. You know, there's, it's not going to be a real prostitute sitting on waters and riding a dragon. So we're going to have to look at what was John trying to convey. Well, the prostitute throughout the Bible is a uh, symbol of a system of false religions. When Israel chases after idols, God says they have prostituted themselves. The true bride is the church of Jesus Christ. She is the pure and spotless bride. So everything that is not the church of Jesus Christ is part of the great prostitute. She sits on many waters. Waters is another word for uh, peoples, usually Gentile peoples, but the peoples of the world. So sitting on many waters, she rules over many peoples. When you think about only 2 billion out of 8 billion at the moment claim Christianity, you can see how the prostitute has reign over most of the people in the world. And so the prostitute represents false religion of every kind. It is the religion of self-salvation and self-effort and idols. Whatever is not the true and living God is part of this false religion and this prostitute. John continues with the portrait of the harlot. Then the angel came, carried me away into the in the spirit into the desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and set ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The title was written on her forehead, Mystery Babylon, the great mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore the testimony of Jesus. <laughs> and again, more symbolism. The woman rides the beast. Now, the beast was the government of the Antichrist. So she's not only related to the government, but in some ways controls it, riding the beast. The beast doesn't ride her. She rides the beast. She's got the color of scarlet, which is the color of prostitution. That's the kind of cord that Rahab let down out of the window. She's wearing purple. That's the color of the wealthy. And so now we have the religion of money, the religion of prosperity, uh, the religion that takes all your money but doesn't give you anything in return. She has a gold cup, and it looks good on the outside, but on the inside it's full of evil and abominations. This is an imitation of of the cup of Jesus, the cup of salvation, but the cup of the harlot has no power to save. On her head is written Mystery Babylon. Babylon in the Bible is the, play, is the origin place of all evil. The beginning of evil in Genesis chapter 11 is in Babylon. And the most city, evil city in the future coming up in Revelation 17 and 18 is Babylon. This could refer to the literal, physical, geographical area in, in current, you know, in Iraq, but that's a, a ruin. And God promised that nobody would ever resettle that ruin in Isaiah. He said uh, only wild animals will dwell there. So most of us think that this is a representation of another system besides someplace in Iraq. But we'll see. She is drunk with the blood of the saints. That means she's persecuting the true followers of God and Jesus Christ. But one detail is most shocking to John. 
He says, when I saw her, I was great, greatly astonished. Then the angel said to me, why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and ten horns. The beast which you saw once was, it now is not, and will come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast, because he once was, now is not, and yet will come. I'm going to have to admit, uh, I'm out of my element. Um, you know, there are just some puzzle pieces that are really hard to place, and this is one of them. Uh, does the Antichrist get killed and then come back to life? Uh, it's... It, I wish I had all the answers, but I don't. So I guess I'll just have to live with my uh, lack of information there. I will keep working with the puzzle piece, and you never know when God will reveal something. But what can we say about this? Well, the beast is the same as the one in Revelation 13. Antichrist is the political ruler, but he needs the help of false religion, the prostitute, to hold power over the people. The angel continues. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. And again... I'm going to be a little out of, out of my element, but there are some clues here. Seven Hills has always been a description of the city of Rome. All right, Rome is the city on seven hills. And I think that is why John is so shocked. How could the church in Rome betray her savior? In John's day, Rome was the premier church it was the center church of the empire. It was the place of Peter and Paul. And so it was the prime church of its day. Politically, Rome was the seat of the empire. Rome ruled over kings. So Rome fits for John's time. At that time, Domitian, John, was being persecuted. So the emperor is persecuting the church, given authority to persecute the saints. And Domitian was very much an egotist. He was declaring himself to be God and people had to worship him and all of that. And so for John's day, it certainly fits the Roman Empire. And that's what leads a lot of interpreters to speculate that in the future, there will be a revived Roman Empire. Certainly possible. You know, some were looking at NATO and all of that. And when NATO was 10 nations strong. Oh, look, it's a 10 headed kingdom. Now NATO has about 20 nations. So hmm, it still could be. But you know, as history changes, we have to kind of look at the puzzle piece again and see if it still fits. Throughout history, this harlot has been identified as the Roman Catholic Church. And at times it has fit the Roman Catholic Church. Martin Luther is perhaps the most famous, saying that the Pope was the Antichrist and the Roman Church was the harlot. But today, that doesn't fit in every detail. Catholics are not persecuting other Christians. They did at times, certainly during the Reformation, which is why Martin Luther thought so, but not now. They do not rule over kings. At one time, the Catholic Church was very influential in Europe over royal affairs, but not now. And they aren't tied to 10 governments. And so we have to look at some kind of future false church. Might still be the Catholic Church, but at the moment it doesn't fit. And maybe we need to look at all of Christendom and see how we have all shared in this harlot and become a part of the harlot. There are so many ways that the modern church has strayed from Jesus and has become a false religion. Here are some examples. The welcoming and affirming movement. This is the movement that affirms homosexuality as an acceptable alternate lifestyle in God's sight because it's all about love. There's nothing in the Bible that supports that. It's a false teaching. We have the prosperity gospel. God wants you to be happy. Just send in $10, he'll send you 100 
And certainly there are passages, where, you know, where if you give, it will come back to you, pressed down, shaken together. And so we do have this blessing in return of blessing. But the Bible also promises that in this life we will have trial and tribulation. And so we have to take the good with the bad. Some charismatic groups are putting forth that you must speak in tongues as an evidence of the Holy Spirit. That's not what the Bible says. Tongues is a gift. Gifts are distributed according to the discretion of the Spirit, and not everybody speaks in tongues, but they still have the Spirit of God. Universalism. This is the teaching that everyone will go to heaven, whether you get a second chance or God will not send anybody to hell or there's no such thing as hell. Universalism has been around for a long time, since the second century in origin, but it has been continuously and consistently condemned by the Orthodox Church. Hell is a real place. Unsaved people will go there, and that is what makes our mission so vital in this world. Many denominations are straying from true biblical teaching in so many ways. They're just denying what the Bible says. The Bible says that heaven and earth will pass away, but the words of God will never pass away. We need to stay true to what the Bible says. If we deviate from the Bible, that is just a man-made teaching. We have some denominations that emphasize legalistic judgmentalism. They're all about the rules. And if you break the rules, you are shunned or banned or barred or put under the, all of these things. And we need to remember grace that law is not the only way that God operates. At the opposite end, there are many with a liberal view of a cuddly, warm, fuzzy God who never punishes anybody and he doesn't care about sin because everybody's going to go to heaven. It's kind of an offshoot of universalism. Both legalistic judgment, judgmentalism and this cuddly God are false views of the true and living God. A right view of the true and living God is that he is holy and righteous and pure. In him, there is no imperfection at all. He is always good and always righteous. And so we do need to follow the law of God because it is a good law from a good God. It's a holy law from a holy God. At the same time, we recognize we cannot obey the law. We are sinners. And so we need the grace and the mercy and the pardon and the forgiveness of God. And that is what God does to us because he loves us so much. He sent Jesus to die on the cross so that we could have grace and mercy and forgiveness. But that does not mean that he sweeps sin under the rug or ignores it or that it doesn't count or that it doesn't make him angry. It still does. And we need those two views of God held in balance. The religious right. The religious right is riding the beast. They want to control the country. I'm talking in America now. They want to control the country by controlling the government and basically forcing people to obey Christian values through the legislation system. And I said in a previous video, uh, I still believe in separation of church and state. I want Christians to influence government. I certainly want righteous government but I do not believe that Christians should take over the government and force everybody. That doesn't work. And we should have a look at the Catholic Church. They still have some false teachings. Purgatory. Purgatory is not mentioned in the Bible. Praying to Mary and the saints. That is taking away honor and glory due to God and giving it to dead human beings. The sacramental theology that... Uh, the Eucharist turns into the actual body and blood and the baptism actually washes away sin. There's nothing in the Bible that supports that. It leans more towards a symbolic view. I'll own my bias as a Protestant. But when we put all of this together, the main point here is that every section of the church has played the harlot in one way or another. We need to be faithful followers of God who faithfully interpret the word of God in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Isaiah had it right. All we like sheep have gone astray and the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. 
because of all of this sin and false religion, the fall of Babylon is coming. And so the angel issues the warning, come out of Babylon, leave the religion of self, leave the religion of idols, leave the false church, come to the true church, the church that follows the word of God, the church that loves the Bible and makes every effort to live it out as faithfully as we can. This is how we can avoid being part of the harlot. We can live in the power of the Holy Spirit. We can have a balanced view of God that is based on what God reveals about himself in the Bible. It's not what we make up. It's not our opinion. It's not what we think. It's what God says about himself. God calls us to come out of the worldly systems, to come out of Babylon, the false religion. It is doomed to destruction. And now is the time to put our faith in Jesus Christ and follow him faithfully. Thanks for listening, and I hope you have a great day.